Hello and welcome back everybody to our final installment on the Civil War. This is our final video. Um, we are in the final stretch. It's late 1864 going into 1865 and we're going to shift our focus from the Western Theater to the Eastern Theater. What's changed? General Ulysses S. Grant has now been given charge of the Army of the Potomac and with that a change in priorities. And this is going to make a big difference. General Grant, unlike his predecessors, doesn't necessarily think that Richmond should be the primary goal. And so he shifts it. He shifts all of his efforts to destroying Lee's army, destroying the Army of Northern Virginia with the understanding that once you do that, Richmond will be defenseless and fall from that. So that's Grant's, and of course Lincoln, ha, you know, he has Lincoln's blessing. That's Grant's motivation. That's his primary objective to destroy the Army of Northern Virginia. And probably the number one weapon that he has going into this fight is an almost unexhaustible supply of men, something that Lee does not have, and that's what's going to make this particular, you know, gear very different. Another thing to keep in mind: this is going to happen at the same time as Sherman's going to break out of Tennessee and push against General Johnston to reach Atlanta. In fact, the Atlanta campaign and the Overland campaign occur within a day of each other. But we're going to focus on this one. And of course, we always wait for spring. And on May 5th is when General Grant <clears throat> starts his push into Western, I mean, in, in, into Virginia, um, commencing what is known as Overland campaign, probably the bloodiest six weeks of the entire Civil War. You would think that towards the end, both sides are exhausted, and we might get a bit of relief by the number of the number of casualties. On the contrary, it's only going to grow worse. Six weeks for about a hundred miles, and over fourteen battles, some large and some small. Both armies are going to go after each other. Grant, unlike his predecessor, keeps the Lees, well, right, and just goes after him, go after him, goes after him, no matter the losses. And the losses are going to be huge. On the average, the Union is going to lose two men to every man the Confederacy uses, uh, loses, but the Union has something, an almost unextinguishable number of men to replace him with. Lee tries to lure Grant into a dense wooded area called the Wilderness. Okay, By doing this, he neutralizes Union artillery, which is superior at this point to um, Confederate artillery. He also hopes to, he hopes to stall Grant in this wooded area until the November elections. Long story short, Brutal fighting, nothing like you know we've already known from the Civil War, except that this takes place in a very wooded area. Um, at the end of three days, Lee is essentially saved by reinforcements um, that came in with General Longstreet. Um, in the end, we're talking about 30,000 casualties on both sides over three days of battle. Probably the most tragic story um, of that wilderness battle in itself was the fighting itself caused a fire, and the fire ended up taking the lives of many of the wounded that made scattered on, on the forest floor. Grant, um, not wanting to be pinned down in the wilderness, as was Lee's uh, objective, decides to move his army and give Lee the chase, move it south towards Spotsylvania. In doing so, um, this more directly threatens Richmond, and of course it's meant to lure, to bait Lee to come after Grant. Here we're going to see the beginning of some very dug-in positions, more static fighting, if you will. Um, Jeb Stewart, well, one of Lee's top generals, dies in a clash with uh, General Sheridan, who's a Union cavalry commander. Uh, in the end, Spotsylvania is the third bloodiest battle of the war, and it continues. You know, wilderness, Spotsylvania, eventually down to Coal Harbor, uh, 
directly threatening Richmond. Eventually, Richmond's going to fall, but you know, that's a bit of a foreshadowing until they eventually settle down in Vicksburg, I mean, in Petersburg, um, a good six weeks after it all started. So this is the Overland Campaign. Images here, the Confederate uh, prisoners of war, the fires, and uh, the Battle of the Wilderness, um, and just the incredible amount of death and, 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 and destruction that this uh, last desperate six weeks of the war rendered. And you really have to ask yourself, like, at the beginning, Lee is trying to stall Grant, trying to stall him. Maybe, maybe the South could find an end to this war if McClellan wins in November. <clears throat> you know, that's Lee's objective and you know, why he continues to fight. And at the end of those six weeks, um, Lee decides to settle into Petersburg. Okay, It's the only way that he could continue to defend Richmond that is to the north of him, but not too far away. Petersburg has the advantage of having the Appomattox River running through it, as well as the convergence of a rail line and several roads. Um, if he digs his, if he digs in here, and the point is to wait it out um, until November, if he digs in here, he could put up a pretty good defense against Grant um, and wait to see what happens. And it, it, it's easy to supply. Um, but, you know, Lee's dealing with, you know, incredible losses, not just to combat, but, you know, already there are shortages that are reaching the army throughout Confederate society. Um, already he's dealing with desertions, um, the likes of which he has not seen up until this point in the war. Um, this is the beginning, you know, here we get foreshadowing as to the future of warfare in itself. Whereas most of the war, we have a mental image of men uh, for the most, not, not completely true. I mean, they, they, they did dig defensive fortifications, but we had a mental picture of men in open fields firing at each other. Petersburg is the first one that starts to, you know, that starts to abandon that Napoleonic uh, posturing, if you will, of shooting at each other from across a field and actually digging trenches. So it almost looks a lot like the type of fighting we're going to see in World War One, which is, you know, still another, you know, 60 years away almost um so yes petersburg very much is trench warfare um it lasts for nine months for nine months uh, petersburg is under siege by general grant and his larger union army and his artillery uh for nine months uh, lee holds the line if you will even after the november elections end up with a lincoln win then at that point, you know, December, January, February, March, April, those last desperate months of the Confederacy, you really have to wonder why they were still fighting. Um, both sides dug over 30 miles of trenches to the south and to the north of Petersburg. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it, uh, you know, essentially, it's going to be 60,000 Confederate soldiers versus 125 Union soldiers, not that Lee was has never been outnumbered before. And and the casualty rates are pretty much, you know, the same as we've seen throughout the war. Uh, Union soldiers, you know, two for every one Confederate soldier that's a casualty. But again, you know, Lee could not replace those losses like Grant can. Probably one of the most tragic battles that took place in Petersburg was the Battle of the Crater. It was kind of a crazy idea. They decided to dig a tunnel underneath the Confederate defenses, uh, put explosives on the end, and blow it up and create a, 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 a crater. And they were actually going to throw a, an all-African-American unit uh, to then swarm into and past you know, the Confederate defenses. Um, they were told that once the crater blows up, you're supposed to run around it, run around the edge of the crater that was, was created. But they picked another unit to do it. They blew it up, and the unit ran straight into the crater with no way of coming out. And then they ran that African-American unit into the crater as well. So what you end up with, insanity. I mean, once, once, once they blew that hole open, that instantly killed something like 300 Confederate soldiers. But they're going to keep fighting for hours. Um, it's a 30-foot hole deep, by the way. 30-feet um, deep hole, by the way. 
at the end, 3.7 thousand Union casualties, 1.5 thousand casualties on the Confederate side. That battle alone. Well, in the end, by the time we get to April, Lee's already lost two-thirds of his army, the vast majority to desertions. Um, they're ill-fed, they're ill-equipped. You got little boys, um, for the most part, um, doing the soldiering that grown men are just not around to anymore. Um, and it's by April 2nd that Grant decides to assault um, the Confederate lines, and he punches through. Um, A.P. Hill, or General A.P. Hill, is killed during the last days of Petersburg. Um, that night on April, on April 2nd, when Grant does make it, punches a hole through the Confederate defenses, uh, Lee decides that um, it's time to uh, abandon ship, if you will. And at night, he flees west um, with what's left of his army, which is um, about a third of what it used to be, about 28,000 men. Um, so, yeah. Um, and by the way, throughout the entire Battle of Petersburg, the, the, the casualties are much smaller um, than the battles we've seen before. They're much smaller. Um, something like 28,000 Confederate soldiers um, died to 42,000 Union soldiers. And that's that's an image of the of the Battle of the Crater. I should have shown that when I was explaining that battle. But yes, that's the crater they were supposed to um, run around, if you will. Um, upon news that Lee uh, abandoned uh, Petersburg and is heading west, he's heading west hoping to link up with the Army of Tennessee led by General Johnston and, and perhaps uh, take the fight to the mountains of North Carolina. Um, so again, upon the hearing of Lee's abandonment of, um, <clears throat> of Petersburg, the Confederate government decides to flee. Um, they take the last train on the only train line that the South still controlled from Richmond to Danville. They take the last train, um, Jefferson Davis and all of his government, the last train out of Richmond. They give orders to burn down all the warehouses and munition stores so they don't fall into Union hands. But that fire that was supposed to be you know, targeted spreads throughout the city and wreaks significant destruction by fire throughout Richmond. There you see the Confederate flag on fire, which is pretty much the only appropriate way to display a Confederate flag. Um, <clears throat> the following day, believe it or not, President Lincoln on April 3rd physically steps foot in Richmond and walks the streets of Richmond against the better advice of his entourage, and he is joined by hundreds of free slaves um, that join President Lincoln as he makes his way to where Jefferson Davis used to live, the Confederate White House. So that's an interesting story in itself. So Richmond falls, it's abandoned, there's a fire, Lincoln visits the following days, and Jefferson Davis is on the run. And here we end up at the last battle of the war. It took Lee's, what was left of Lee's army, no more than 30,000 men, one week to march 100 miles west, low on food. Um, but Grant's right after him. But Grant's right after him and eventually catches up to Lee before arriving at Lynchburg, because I think Lee's goal was to get to Lynchburg, perhaps he could resupply his, you know, what's left of his army. And they beat him at the pass, if you will. Um, they cut him off at a town called Appomattox, um, right by the Appomattox Courthouse. Um, he's outnumbered, you know, three to one at this point. And the road forward is cut off by Union Cavalry, led by General Sheridan. Lee actually attempts to punch through um, this cavalry that appears to be blocking his, 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 uh, his road to Lynchburg. 
but Lee is surprised by the fact that it's not just cavalry, there's also two corps of infantry. Um, several hours of fighting, which surprised Grant, because Grant, you know, actually wrote in his memoirs, you know, that Lee intends to keep fighting. And Lee sends um, a note to Grant um, expressing his willingness to cease fire and to surrender his army. After four years of fighting, Lee realized that there was no more fighting left. There was no way forward. A lot of his men um, came to him and suggested, you know, to go to the mountains and continue this war as a guerrilla war against the Union. But, but Lee suggested otherwise. Um, he, just like much of the country, had seen enough death and destruction and just wanted to put this episode behind them. So it was at the, at the Appomattox Courthouse that Lee um, met with Grant, his adversary. Um, he asked Grant for the conditions of his surrender, and Grant said that his men would be paroled immediately. All they had to do was lay down their arms, and that the officers could take their sidearms with them, but they could also go home. And, you know, the question is, why was this so lenient? And this was direct order from Lincoln. Lincoln wanted this to end now. Lincoln was focused on reconciliation. And um, the easier the ending is, um, the better for everyone. So now let's look at others. So this is it. This is it. The war ended here. The war ended here on April 9th, 1865. Um, <clears throat> let's look at some other, um, let's look at some data here. Right? At its peak, the Union Army numbered 1.5 million men, the Confederate Army a little over a million men. And keep in mind, that's just about every able-bodied white man of, of fighting age. When we look at causes of death, remember, we talk about casualties. Casualties are anywhere, from, or losses in general, either killed in combat or captured or deserted. Um, <clears throat> wounded. A quarter of a million Union soldiers, more than a quarter of a million, to about 100,000 cavalry soldiers. I mean, the Confederate soldiers. Um, <clears throat> that means non-mortally. That means they were able to recover and, and take back the field, or return to the field. Died from those wounds, however, okay? Uh, the Union seemed to have had better medicine. A lot less of them died from their wounds, proportionate to how many were wounded, than, than the Confederates. Died from disease. This is the one that surprises everyone, Okay? Everybody expects, you know, combat deaths to be the most significant, you know, uh, form of dying in the war. Not that it's not. It is. It's still it's the overwhelming number. But dying from disease. And remember, you know, in the mid-1900s, they did not have the scientific medical progress that we have today. Battlefield medicine did not exist as it does today. Uh, doctors did not sanitize their hands or their instruments. Uh, infection was rampant, there was no antibiotics, uh, few things that could serve as antiseptics, um, not to mention contagious diseases. Um, if one person caught, let's say, tuberculosis, it would spread throughout the camp. Things that could be avoided, gastrointestinal issues like uh, typhoid or cholera, usually caused by not having properly cl uh, cleaned, um, cleaning utensils. Um, drinking contaminated water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Needless to say, scores of people died, not violently on the battlefield, but due to disease. And disease would be a, a bane on uh, on warfare for many, many years to come. The death rate, as a percentage of the total, of the total, um, <clears throat> about 23 percent of the Union Army. Um, would not go home, and about 24% of the Confederate Army. So all in all, what we're talking about, one four men that went off to this war would not come home. And of course, this would be felt disproportionately, um, much more so in the South, particularly because of the way they organized the Army, both the North and South. They organized by state and by community. You would end up with entire towns with their male population completely disappeared. Um, as far as total deaths we've said this before 
Um, you could add up every conflict the United States has been involved in, add up the total number of casualties, and it still doesn't match the Civil War. And that's a conservative number, 600,000. Um, the more recent um, uh, studies claim up to 800,000 because they've been able to identify bodies uh, that scientists did not allow to identify before. Let's talk about prisoners of war because that was also a casualty as well. So many, many hundreds of thousands were captured throughout the, the course of the war on both sides. And in most cases, they were returned in exchanges. Um, but actual prisoners of war, when, when the exchange system broke down, both sides um, held enemy soldiers in, in, in detainment, in confinement, until who knows when the war was going to end. And probably the worst places to be held as a prisoner of war was in the Confederacy, particularly towards those final months or final years, when the Confederacy had all kinds of shortages. You imagine the ones last in line to get anything are going to be the prisons. And, and the worst of these prisons was Andersonville Prison. It was in Georgia. Uh, which every sort of, you know, what we would call human rights abuse was committed against Union soldiers there. And the officers were kept at Libby Prison in Richmond, Virginia. Of course, overcrowded, disease-ridden, under, as you can see in those images down there, underfed. So this is one of the most, you know, infamous um, chapters of this war. 195,000 Union prisoners of war kept in southern uh, prison camps, whereas, uh, which were basically just open pens, whereas 215,000 Confederate prisoners of war kept in um, prison camps in the north. Um, just fun facts, um, you know, remember it's the mid-19th century, so news takes a while to carry. Even though the war ended on April 9th, they didn't get the, meto the memo as far away as, I believe, Texas, New Mexico. The final battle of the war was the Battle of Palmito Ranch that was fought on May 13, 1865. Private John J. Williams was the last casualty of the Civil War. He was shot and died on May 13. The last Confederate general to surrender was a Cherokee himself, kind of a funny name, General Brigadier General Standin Wait, no Stand Wait, who did not himself give up and turn in his arms until June twenty third, eighteen sixty five, and he was all the way in the west, in the most remote western reaches of the Confederacy. Let's explore some other um, chapters of the Civil War. Juneteenth, it's a big deal. Uh, on June 19th, 1865, Texas being the last state for the Union Army to march into and occupy, June 19th, 1865, Union General General Gordon Granger, Major General Gordon Granger, issued his military order in Galveston, Texas, freeing slaves. General Orders Number 3, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, and he's talking about the Emancipation Proclamation, all slaves are free. So the slaves of Texas were the last ones to be freed under the Emancipation Proclamation, but that took all the way until June 19th, 1865. And that's why June 19th is now celebrated and observed as the day that slavery came to an end in this country, as in there was no longer any slavery. And all of this, from the Confiscation Acts, to the Emancipation the Proclamation, to, to this, to the 13th Amendment. This is what it's all for. The 13th Amendment, as everyone knows, is the first of the <clears throat> Reconstruction Era Amendments. You're going to learn about that later. Aimed at, you know, the practice of slavery. Um, the 13th Amendment is the amendment that was added to the Constitution to basically do away with slavery. The only way to do away with it was through a constitutional amendment. Um, this amendment was first passed by the Senate on the 8th of April, 1864, 38 till 6. 
It would have to wait almost another year because there was a lot of debate between the more moderate folks that didn't want some strong wording and the abolitionists that wanted strong wording um, eventually end up with a pretty moderate, you know, land. It's, it's, it's not a perfect amendment. It has problems. Uh, so it passes on the 31st of January, 1865, four months before Lee surrenders and the Confederacy, uh, you know, officially loses this war. It's ratified by two thirds, by the two thirds of the state, the last state required to do so already after Lincoln died um, on the 6th of December, 1865. And, and the wording, the language of it is rather short and succinct, but it has problems. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. And slavery but it leaves a loophole over involunt uh, around involuntary um, servitude in the case of being convicted of committing a crime. And we're going to talk about how that complicated things, the spirit of the 13th Amendment, as we move into Reconstruction. Let's talk about the role of African Americans during the Civil War. Now remember, uh, there was four million slaves in the South. Um, they become the focal point of this war. Um, during the war, and precisely after the Emancipation Proclamation, um, Abraham uh, issues this proclamation um, in order to encourage African Americans to run away from the South. It's a war measure to meant to hurt the Confederacy. Um, between that moment and the end of the war, almost half a million slaves ran away from the South to make it to Union lines. So 12% of the South's slave population. Um, almost immediately, you had ex-slaves signing, well, the Emancipation Proclamation, one of the things it does is it allows for the enlistment of African-American soldiers. And almost immediately, you already have this. Um, over a thousand men, uh, the vast majority of them ex-slaves, sign up for the first African-American volunteer unit, the 54th Massachusetts which was led by um, Colonel Robert Shaw. And the 54th Massachusetts would see its greatest day on the assault on Fort Wagner, South Carolina, where I believe they took on something like 50% casualties that day. Um, later on, the U.S. Army would create the U.S. Colored Troops, and they began to form entire regiments exclusively. It was still segregation. Uh, in, in the military of African-American soldiers. In the end, um, by war's end, 179,000 African-Americans served during the Civil War, uh, making up something like 10% of the Army. Um, over 100,000 of this 179,000 were former slaves uh, that made it to the Union lines and decided to put on the Union uniform and fight for the liberation of their friends and family back south. Very different war for them. Um, African-American soldiers um, in total um, lost 38,000 in casualties, and they suffered a much higher death rate than white soldiers, a 20% death rate. So one in five African-American soldiers would not see the end of this war. Prominent folks, William Harvey Gardney was the first African-American Medal of Honor recipient, having served in the 54th Massachusetts. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Augusta was the first black war surgeon attached to um, <clears throat> the U.S. Colored Troops Regiment. Robert Small's incredibly interesting history. He was both in the U.S. Navy and in the Army. He actually stole a Confederate ship, delivered it to the Union, and what they did was they made him captain of that ship. And as captain of that ship, although never officially, because an African-American couldn't be a commissioned officer in the Navy, but he piloted the ship. He took part in many coastal operations, um, particularly aimed at South Carolina. And, and lastly, here's an image of the relief of the, it stands in Boston Commons, Massachusetts, today in Boston, of, um, of the 54th Massachusetts, if you ever get a chance to see it in person.
uh, you should. On top that they made a film many years ago called Glory. Hey, you got to pay attention to the fact that my particular population, for the most part, is predominantly Hispanic or Latino. And you should know, yes, not overwhelming numbers, but approximately 13,500 Hispanics served during the Civil War. On both sides, the Union and the Confederacy, probably the most, the highest ranking one was Admiral David Farragut, who I've told you before, his father was Spanish. Even though he wasn't raised by his father very long, his father was Spanish, so he does count. Um, given that this is Miami, I want to bring attention to two very interesting individuals, the Fernandez Cavada brothers, Adolfo and Federico, who themselves um, had quite a history during the Civil War. Uh, let's start with Federico. He, uh, both, they were born in Cuba, but they were raised in Pennsylvania. Uh, Federico uh, ended up rising to lieutenant colonel. He was a very talented uh artist, if you will, and so he was basically a, a sketch artist from a balloon. You know, he would raise these balloons to take, you know, he would, so that was basically what he did. He was captured at Gettysburg. He spent about a year at the Libby prison in Richmond. After the war, he was made U.S. Consul to Cuba by the United States government. In 1968, I'm sorry, in 1868, when a, Cuba's first attempt at independence, the Ten Years' War, um, begins, he basically resigns from his diplomatic position and he joins the rebellion against the Spanish government. Um, eventually, by 1870, becoming, being, well, he, they named, they, they, with the rank of general, um, in 1870, being named the commander of all Cuban forces in Cuba, uh, unfortunately, he was captured and executed by the Spanish at the age of 39 in 1871. Despite pleas by General Meade and um, General Grant to the Spanish government for clemency, his brother Adolfo uh, was a captain in Philadelphia's 23rd uh, Pennsylvania Infantry Regiment. He fought at Fredericksburg and Gettysburg where he was wounded when the Ten Years' War began. He went to Cuba and joined his brother. Um, he fought in several battles against the Spanish there. He actually took the city of Camagüey away, away from the Spanish. Um, five months after his brother was executed by the Spanish, he himself would also die in battle. And just like um, there were great examples of Cubans that fought on the right side of history, you also had Cubans that fought on the wrong side of history. For example, Colonel Ambrosio Jose González. He chose to side with the Confederacy. Um, he was educated in Europe and the United States. Um, he had a law degree from the University of Havana. He comes from a very prestigious elite family in Cuba. He was a professor of languages at the University of Havana when the war starts. Uh, he was very much a uh, annexationist. That means that he sided with um, individuals in Cuba a group of individuals in Cuba who wanted to see the United States um, annex Cuba and, and become another slave state. And he very much supported um, Lopez's adventures, uh, mercenary adventures that were financed by people like Jefferson Davis and whatnot. He was actually with Narciso Lopez when Narciso Lopez was captured, but he evaded capture and ended up back in the United States. Um, when the war started, he moved, you know, well, before the war started, he had moved to South Carolina. He was there at Fort Sumter during the assault on Fort Sumter. And the Confederate government eventually named him um, Coastal Artillery Chief of the entire departments of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. He was a good friend of P.T. Birkegaard. And probably the most interesting individual there is Loretta Haneta Velasquez also known as Lieutenant Harry Buford. This lady had a habit of dressing up like a man and finding her way into the Confederate Army. And if you believe her story, she fought in just about every battle of the Civil War. Just about every battle of the Civil War. And she, they would find her and they would dismiss her because they found out that she was really a woman. Eventually, she was captured by the Union, and they made her into a double agent. And it's almost like a, 
too crazy to be true life story. Um, married several times. Actually, it was her husband that encouraged the entire idea of her uh, dressing up like like a Confederate soldier and joining the army. But yes, I mean, you had Hispanics on both the Union side and the Confederate side. And lastly, let's close with this. The war was stressful on everyone. It caused, um, well, if, if they had the term of PTSD at the time, I'm sure... PTD, PSD was, PTSD was rampant across the country and would last for a very long time. Um, but just take this look at President Lincoln. This closing image. That is President Lincoln on the 1st of March, 1861, um, just before taking the presidency. And that is Lincoln on the 5th of February, 1865, roughly about two months before Lee surrenders. And I think you could visually tell the toll that this war took. Keep that in mind. And appreciate that. Um, all right. So that's it. With that, we close our telling of the Civil War. Next time we speak, it's not quite over yet.